dating and makeover expert where I will help you build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. It's so strange. I have been doing this podcast, what, for a year now, and I just realized that I have never really talked about the definition of what this podcast is called, right? Like it's called the Charisma Quotient. And it really is the foundation in which I work with people on and helping people build their confidence, create connections, and eventually find love. And so I want to talk a little bit about that because it really relates to what we're going to dive into today. And so, you know, the word charisma, I, I really got turned on to it because, you know, if you look at the definition, it's the compelling magnetism and attractiveness that draws people to you. And the exciting thing about this is that research says no one is born with charisma. And that's super cool. And I know this because, you know, I work with people, what, from ages 15 all the way up to 90. It doesn't matter. You can learn this stuff. And when you focus on these three ingredients that I want to go over, which is in my charisma quotient formula you can attract whatever it is in your life and you can build these skills. And so really quickly, as you know, I always start from the outside and then I go in, which is a little different than most. But for me, I believe focusing on the first ingredient, which I call style intelligence. I made that up by the way, because it goes along with my other two ingredients. It, this is the way we present ourselves, right? It's, it's presenting yourself in a congruent way that creates a comprehensive picture that reflects the real and the best version of you. So this is when I talk about building out your dating wardrobe, right? Having the right clothes that is congruent and reflects the best version of you. It's your posture. It's your body language. It's how you appear in the outside world. And to me, I love working with that first because that can really build your confidence, especially as you walk out into the world and you feel different and people respond to you different. The second ingredient to the charisma quotient is what I call, well, and this is not my word. This is something that we're going to really hone in on today. Emotional intelligence is a big buzzword but it's been around for years. I think people are really now understanding how important it is. Emotional intelligence is how you identify, express, and manage your thoughts, manage your feelings so that you connect with others and it really can impact your interactions. And finally, the third ingredient is your social IQ. That's how you read people and how people read you. It's how you communicate. It's, it's, and yes, this is where flirting happens, guys. <laughs> so I believe when you focus on all these three things, tapping into the characteristics of charisma, like your presentation, your emotional expressiveness, and social sensitivity, you will increase your chances for attracting the right partner. And, and so... I want to just go over a, a, this is just right at the tip of my mind because it's a woman that I've been working with. Gosh, it's been about almost a year. She's in her forties and this is how important emotional intelligence is. Your moods, your expressiveness. She hadn't had much dating experience and her biggest issue was that she had a hard time expressing herself and connecting with men. So guess what happened? She would have a ton of interactions with guys. She was very social. She was friendly. But men weren't feeling her and therefore was not feeling the chemistry from her. So she was falling into the friend zone every single time. And over the years, what had also built up, which was a big problem, was a negative mindset and an outlook on dating in general. So of course, I focused on her style intelligence first. We got a complete makeover going. I got her some dresses and heels and some really, really cute pants that look like leather pants. She couldn't believe she bought it. But I will say when she bought these, this costume, so to speak, because I, she really didn't feel it at first, but when she walked out into the world and she saw the impact it had, like 
even guys who she was friends with were noticing her in a different way and said, you know, you're looking a little sexy. So she had this charisma glow about her. It increased her confidence. But then we were ready to work on her expressiveness. Now, this is what's really interesting. So she grew up in a home where emotions were not expressed, right? So she didn't have that language. And so I was just teaching her, hey, this is no different than learning Spanish or German. You just, you never learned it. So we were practicing and I taught her my social engagement formula. But here is the interesting thing. So what shows up offline shows up online too. And it is 2018. So we have to talk about dating. And you know what? Her text exchanges were just as important in expressing herself than offline. So the good news is she landed a guy. You know, we, we got the profile up, her pictures did magic. She had a guy that she was really excited about and he asked her out. And so they're in the beginning stages of dating. But here's, here's the thing that, where she got stuck. Her text exchanges were really dry and he wasn't asking her out again. And so I said, okay, look, show me your text exchange, and I want to see the conversation. So I look at it, and I diagnose exactly the problem. And so what, what was happening is instead of commenting on what he was writing her about or how she felt when she had an amazing kiss with him the other night, she just responded and fell in the trap of reporting her day. And so then guess what? He reported his day. So there's this huge exchange of what he did yesterday and what she did today rather than connecting. So I told her to change what she wrote by asking how the visit was with his sister, which was one of the comments he made, and sprinkle it with how she felt missing his kiss the other night. And so, of course, it worked like a charm and he asked her out pretty much immediately. So... Folks, how we identify and manage and express our moods has a huge impact in the way we connect and communicate with others, so much so. And I tell people this all the time. I know a lot of people focus on the visual aspect of attraction, but I believe this is one of the key components to attraction. I see it happen all the time when people work on this. So that's why you're going to love the guest I brought on today. He is called the father of corporate culture for his industry-changing transformational theories and has helped Fortune 500 companies grow and powerful CEOs thrive. And he founded the world's first culture-shaping firm. I'm going to have him talk about that. And he's a highly rated conference presenter. He's an author of many, many books, one of which I just am so excited about. It's called The Mood Elevator. We're going to talk about that too. His personal purpose is to help people live life at their best mentally, emotionally, physically, and purposely. But here's the thing that is so awesome. He is nearly 83 years old and he's competing in triathlons and jumping on trampolines with his many grandkids. (laughs) He's clearly doing something right. But the million dollar question is, how does he do it all? I have a hint. Has to do with his mind, has to do with his body, and yes, his moods. Welcome, Dr. Larry Sen. How are you? Great to be here. Uh, oh Loved your introduction. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Well, I, my God, you made it easy with your bio. I am so interested. I'm sure everybody is interested in your story. Like, Can you just go over like how, I know you've had a long journey and I've I've read a little bit of your story, but just what got you into doing what you do and how have, like, what is your secret sauce? Well, the story quickly is I came out of college with a professor who started a, a, what's called a performance improvement firm to go into organizations to make them be more effective. And Mm. what I was struck by almost immediately was the problem of, that most organizations were like dysfunctional family. <laughs> they had <laughs> politics, they had yeah. resentment, they had turf issues, they had territory, they had all this stuff. They had, they had poor relations, they had lack of trust, lack of respect. Mm. And that really got my attention because a uh, long time ago, but we were asked by Sam, a guy named Sam at a place called Walmart to help him re-engineer <sighs> the process to bring low cost goods to rural America. And this no was a man with a passion. He was uh, a man with this vision of increasing the quality of life in rural America 
by doing this. And we were helping them streamline the process to do that. And it was so easy. And everybody there, the relationships were the key. People were collaborative. They were trusting. They liked each other. They worked together well. They, they, had, they had a high emotional intelligence in working with each other. At the same time, I was trying to do the same thing for a company called Woolworth in New York. And I wow. go, I fly from Benton, Bentonville to New York City, and it'd be like going to the morgue. It was just a bunch of <laughs> old men. They were old men sitting around a table, and it seemed like their only purpose was to maintain the status quo. And they had bureaucracy, politics, turf issues. And I said to myself, you know, that little company in Bentonville is going to take over the world, and this one's going to die. And there's something about people and organizations and relationships that, that they didn't teach me in school. And so that led me back to a study of organizational behavior and, and mm-hmm. it, uh, actually I took a lot of courses in psychology, anthropology, sociology to try to understand what was this thing in organizations, which we call culture today, which is why United Airlines drags people off airplanes and Southwest makes them laugh. <laughs> <It's> relationships. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's become a big deal. And we've had a chance to work with, gosh, 125 Fortune 500 CEOs, but but from the very beginning, actually going back to my purpose, mm-hmm. my purpose was that there were all these dysfunctional behaviors. People really didn't know how to collaborate. They didn't know yeah. how to build trust. They didn't have high emotions. What if I could find a way to make them healthier, not only in their work life, but in their home life? What if I could find a way to help them when they went home, really be home and learn to listen to loved ones, not just listen to colleagues. Mm-hmm. What if I could find a way to, to, to help them value relationships, not only at work, but put more value in relationships at, at, in their life in general? And so that began my quest to find a way to really create healthy, high-performing people and very positive relationships in the world. So we've worked in, we have our materials in 10 languages, wow. uh, is in, I think, seven languages. And um, so that's kind of where it came from. Now, along the way, what I discovered was that there was, for most everybody, there's a time when they're at their best, kind of top of their game. Mm-hmm. So the question is, how can we spend those times when you feel more secure, you feel better about yourself, you're kind of in the flow? Uh, we all have moments like that. So how do you make that a way of life, not just a, a fleeting thing? And so the premise of the book and part of the work is that we all ride this thing I call a mood elevator. Uh, and when we're at our best, we're, we, life is, is amusing and curious to us. We're open. We're trusting. We're resourceful. We're creative. We're grateful. Mm-hmm. And then we have those times where we're really, really easily irritated and bothered, where we worry, <laughs> where we're mm-hmm. impatient, uh, where we're self-righteous. Uh, uh, we have these times where we're in the lower floors, we, where, when we're low, when we get depressed for the moment. So all the way from depression to gratitude and perhaps love, is is this mood elevator. And so I began to say, how can we really help people understand this and learn to ride it? And that really is where the book came from. That is so interesting. Well, okay, so you have this kind of journey with the businesses and, and an amazing tool now that you've developed with the mood elevator, but like, did you incorporate that in your personal life? And, and like, I'm just interested how it affected you personally and, and attracting, cause you've been married a while, right? My wife and I've been together for 45 years. Back when uh, we to Las Vegas to, <laughs> to see <laughs> Beatles love for the second time and, and uh, listen Aww. to Jerry Seinfeld and, and, uh, and that was great. So yes, we, we are in lo- we're deeply in love and we have this amazing uh, open, we don't hold things back, but always mm-hmm. loving and supportive relationship. And I think the heart is our understanding of what this is. So w- what it's about is it, it's really, people need to understand where moods come from because we yeah. tend to blame the world on moods because somebody did something, I'm this way. But, but let me tell you a really quick story it'll tell you, and it'll help you understand where moods come from. There's this guy who, right before he left work, was told by one of his buddies that they're going to shut down his division of the business. Mm-hmm. And that really caught him off guard. He worked here about 10 years. So he, he didn't want to go home and worry his wife. So he sat in the park on a bench. He started thinking first about all the dire consequences of losing his job. He might lose his mortgage. His kids couldn't go to the right school. Then, so there he was at the bottom of the mood elevator at depressed. Then he moved up to angry about the company. Why would mm-hmm. they do this? to me. And he got to anger. Then he said, wait a minute, this guy is always starting rumors. It's probably not true. 
So then he went to relief. <laughs> and then he said to himself, oh, my God, I hate this job. <laughs> maybe, mm-hmm. this is, maybe this is a sign for me. Maybe I'll get a package and I can start that dog grooming business I really want to do. And all of a sudden he started to get excited about the possibility of the future and all the things he could do. And then he saw a little kid walk by and he said, what am I sitting here in the park for when I go home? Johnny's going to run up, grab me by the leg and say, I love you, dad. I'm a blessed man. So what Uh, caused him to ride all those things? Well, what it was, was his thinking. Yeah. So every moment, every day, we create our experience of life through our thought, worried feelings, uh, worried thoughts, create worried feelings, grateful thoughts, create grateful feelings, loving thoughts, create loving feelings, angry thoughts, create angry feelings. We are the producer. We are the director. We are running the movie. And yet we blame life on it. So the first thing we need to do is understand we're kind of doing it to ourselves. <laughs> exactly. And n- exactly. not blame others. Well, and, and, um, yeah, yeah. No, can I just no, mention something? Because as you're talking, Please. I can hear people say, and this is something I see show up a lot with my clients, kind of like the one that I was talking about in the beginning, where people might have all these feelings that you're talking about in the bottom of the elevator, but they're not knowing how to identify it, right? Like they know something's going on in their body and they know it's a negative feeling, but it often gets mislabeled and then of course not expressed or it gets expressed in ways that aren't healthy, right? So I, I always, you know, talk to people about ways to identify you know, the, the feelings that they're having, cause like anger and frustration, and that can be really confusing. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like it's in terms of the mood meter and how people can do that? Yes. Generally it's just a negative negativity with intensity or negativity yeah. that drains energy is your energy. So if you feel your energy and spirit really plummeting mm-hmm. in a sense, it doesn't matter why, just know that, know that you're not in a good place. If you feel yourself ramping up and getting overly intense. So here's a question for you and all your group. Have yeah. you ever said something to a loved one? Have you ever said something to a loved one you wish you could take back? And no, says, never. Yeah, well, where, <laughs> where, <laughs> so where were you on the mood elevator? I guarantee you were down. Have you ever sent a, a text message you wish you could retrieve? Mm-hmm. Of course you have. Where were you? You were, you were, you know, when I get an email <laughs> in and I tend to get emails as well, text messages, and it hits my buttons. Yeah. I always, I, I, I always hit save. And then I wait till the next morning. I read it again. Then maybe I start with, thank you for letting me know. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and I modify it. Yeah. I modify it some. So, so here's the first big tip for everybody. And that mm-hmm. is, if you just know that your thinking is unreliable and you need to be careful, Whenever you're in the lower mood state. And uh, so all of our clients carry a little pocket card that's got the mood elevator on it to keep reminding them. Yeah, I, I'm, I really was reactive to that. I probably shouldn't say it right now. Not that I shouldn't say it. Like, here's the deal. My wife and I got mm-hmm. together in the 70s. And mm-hmm. that was like the tell it like it is here. Don't go to bed at night with anything unsaid. And some nights she didn't go to bed. <laughs> I always yeah, should. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Depending on what but, you did during that but, time. Right. <laughs> right. But. But then we said, you know, have you ever ever had a successful argument in the middle of the night? No. So we made this deal because we both have this understanding about moods. Mm -hmm. We would not take on any issues unless we both were in a healthy place. We would we would we would always make sure we committed to taking them on or discussing them, but only when we're in a healthy place. And you know what happened? All the drama went out of my relationship. In fact, it scared the hell out of me (laughs) Uh (laughs) because I was so used to the, the the fight and make up. And all of a sudden, some of that intensity was gone. But we had this much more loving, supporting relationship because we understood this notion. And incidentally, what is emotional intelligence? Mm-hmm. It's understanding your state of mind, knowing you're angry. Right. It, what's about, it's understanding the impact you have on others. You don't have a good impact when you're angry. And so it is about having a high emotional intelligence that... Uh, you know, clearly that second point you made is a really big deal. And it's pretty simple. Be mm-hmm. aware that you ride a mood elevator. Yeah. Be aware when you're up, you're going to do just fine. Step out, take on the world. Be aware when you're down. It's like going out on an icy night <laughs> in a car. You drive really slowly and carefully. You know, what's great too about that is that I think it gives people permission to have that space and time to think about it. I think a lot of the, you know, people say, well, you know, I was really mad and this happened and now it's too late. 
you know, cause I, I said it already, but like you said, it's never too late. And I think it's really important to stop and really think about what's going on in your body. What really got you angry in that moment and label it. I do this exercise with people too, where I kind of break it apart. You know, that I feel message and I teach people mm-hmm. that a lot and I break it into three columns, you know, what you're feeling, what's the trigger, and then what would you like to have happen? And when I dissect what people are feeling, you know, their first gut reaction is the bigger negative emotion, like probably really low in the elevator. Like I just, I'm pissed off. I'm like, okay, well let's dissect that a little bit. And when we have time to really dissect it, we come up with literally at least 10 emotions that are wrapped up in there. Cause usually there's more than one, you know? And so I like what you said. It just, it allows people time to absorb and really identify things so they can come back and, you know, do something positive in the way that you're communicating or, or solve a problem between the two of you. And, you know, that's what conflict resolution is all about. You said something interesting. You let it slip a little. I don't know if you realize you did that. Um, you said, you said that I used, like, you were kind of used to the drama. You almost felt like it was weird. Yeah. So, Okay. So like what used to happen and then how did you stop yourself? Cause that's what I think people want to know. Like, how did you stop that behavior? The drama. Well, I mean, the drama was you'd get up, you'd get upset. And what happens is you'd fire at them. They'd fire back at you. It'd be just a series of volleys and you'd end up hurting. Yeah. And, and uh, but then eventually, eventually, if you, lo- if you really loved them enough, eventually you'd sleep the next year. Sometime you'd say, I'm sorry. You'd make up, you'd try to do better, but then you'd do it again. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and so what it, it really takes some understanding. So there's some, some pillars to this. One is if our thinking is creating our, like the guy in the story, if our thinking is creating mm-hmm. our reality, and if we understand that everybody is doing what makes sense to them based on their thinking, everybody, so there's a sense of, there's a sense of, uh, of um, assuming innocence. In others, uh, okay. So and so's so and so's going off right now, but they're having a really bad day. Mm-hmm. So and so's going off right now, but but they just lost this. Uh, I I don't know what's on their mind, but obviously something's really bothering them. Maybe I should be curious. So another tip is, on the mood elevator, right in the center, between the higher and lower floors, is the word curiosity or curious. The word curious. So let's say somebody does something you don't like or you don't understand. On the mood elevator, you have a choice of going to irritated, bothered, self-righteous, or you can go to curious. You can say, huh, I wonder why they saw it that way. I wonder why they did that. I'm sure there's some reason they have that makes sense to them. Maybe I should look for that. If, if people just live life in curiosity versus judgment, their whole life would change. I guarantee it. Because there are so many times we make we have assumed motives about yeah. things that aren't true. We assume somebody did something. We find out later they did. I mean, I got in an airplane the other day, and I there's this very important article about a client in the Orange County edition of the LA Times. Mm-hmm. And I put my bag of them in the overhead rack. When I went to sit down, the guy next to me was reading the paper, and I put my and I started to get upset. And I said, "Well, wait a minute." Then I found out my paper had fallen on the floor. That was his paper. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> I was about to chew them yeah. out, <laughs> but 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 I use that I I use that as a, a metaphor for how many times do you find that a they didn't do it or b they didn't mean it or c they were in really bad place at that time weren't thinking clearly and had and, it, and you shouldn't have taken it personally. So this idea of of understanding that everybody's driven by their thinking and it's all we're all different. We all <sighs> see things differently. So so, so yeah. that notion of seeing trying to see innocence. Mm-hmm. and go to curiosity versus judgment will help people break that cycle. It's so great because it also is teaching you to get out of your head and your stuff because often people react b- based on their own stuff, right? That's the classic oh, yeah. projection. Right projection. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. and like what exactly. happened? There was this one woman I was working with and um, she, she had like a little tiff with um, – it was not a, her boss, but it was somebody who was kind of up there. And I guess this woman made some comment about her, how she looked like, you know, it was kind of a backhanded compliment, but 
my client took it like it was really bad. And she was so mad. She let this simmer and the entire day, the entire week until I finally had a coaching call with her. And she told me what happened. I said, you know, is it possible that her intention with this statement was something else other than how you're taking it? And mind you, my client had a lot of like insecurities about her looks. So it was her own stuff. Right. And so To your point, I told her to go back and have a conversation on how she felt in that moment, that it was not too late to address it. In fact, it would actually, like I felt, solicit a nice communication and bonding between the two of them. So she did it because she, you know, I told her, well, she's paying me, so she might as well do what I tell her, right? And so she decided to listen to me and she went back. And do you know, it's exactly like what you and I are talking about. It, this woman, first of all, didn't even remember that statement she said. And she's like, no, I yeah, actually right. think you're really pretty. <laughs> I was meaning it as a compliment, you know? And so, yes, yes. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Come up from a place of curiosity. So that's that's, the, that's mm-hmm. the assumed motives. It really is. And, and yeah. but, but I think in all of this, uh, it starts with ourselves. I mean, I'm going to talk for a moment mm-hmm. about this outside in and inside out. Outside yeah. in is important. I mean, it's really funny. I was listening to you, but mm-hmm. this morning... I put on three different shirts and had my wife look at them because I didn't feel quite <laughs> right in the first two. And uh, this may seem silly, but but no. then I put the third one I, and I said, hey, I feel good in this shirt. It really t- it's tucked in some, it shows my narrow waist, et cetera, whatever. Very, a lot of vanity, but hey, you, so not only uh, I work out, I lift weights, I want to look good, I, mm-hmm. I run. So all that's a part of taking care of yourself. Yes. And, and having having a good body, having a good mind, um, I meditate. I try to, you know, all these things are a part of nurturing yourself. If you can take care of yourself, and you can be good with yourself, and you can live in the higher state of mood, it's an it's a magnet. You will attract more people than you can imagine to you. Oh, That's I'm what not. happens. Amen. Well, and you're the perfect person to talk. I mean, you should be the spokesperson at 83 years old, jumping on a trampoline still. Like, I mean, there's no excuse, people. It, it, we're hearing it right from him. And I no, it does. And the stuff that I talk about with the outside, it, it does make a difference. Like ladies, you know, come on when you're having, and even guys, come on, let's face it. We're having a bad hair day. I'm sorry. My, my mood elevator is way down below. Like it really affects me. So, you know, going to a place and getting your hair done can actually, I feel make you rise in the mood elevator because that impacts your mood and the way that you view yourself. Therefore that's going to reflect reflect how people treat you. That's the true definition of image, in fact. And so, yes, when you take care of yourself, oh, love it. I I wish everybody could see a picture of my wife, especially we're together at Caesars, but she's beautiful. And uh, she gets her hair done every other week. She gets her, she gets her hair dyed with all these wonderful different shades she gets her nails done and and every time she does anything like that i notice and compliment her i think that's one of the keys to our our relationship i always see it and and i say wow i like it a little shorter this time or wow look at that hit with your nails or but but she always every day uh Every day she takes, she's beautiful and she takes care of herself And and i think that helps keep our relationship really young and alive Yes. And so there's two things there. One is taking care of yourself and and feeling good about you. But the other is also validating your partner, validating the person you're with, even on dates, you know, for the first time, just noticing things about each other rather than just focusing on yourself. It, you know, it, it does. It's, it's an interplay between both. So what are some other things you do to keep so healthy and, and care for yourself? Like, that's amazing. Well, there, there are certain things... Um, I think it's about um, taking care of yourself in many ways. So Mm -hmm. it's interesting. When we get run down, lack of sleep, drinking, whatever it is, our immune system gets impaired and we catch colds. What's interesting is when we don't take care of ourselves, we catch moods. And so Mm -hmm. something as simple as enough sleep. So I've got my Fitbit and I measure every night how many hours sleep I get and what the nature of my sleep is. So that take care of it. So uh, exercise, exercise uh, clears the mind. If you go out and there's something about the, the pace with the music where it clears your mind. And what's interesting is 
the quieter your mind is, the more you're your best self. What's interesting about the mood elevators, down at worry or depression, it's mm-hmm. just like a free-for-all with the thinking. Go all the way up to gratitude. My wife and I watching last night the sunset in Sunset Beach, California. There was not a single word. It was just a feeling. It was quiet. So this whole notion of if we can, if we can quiet ourselves down, take a deep breath, be more present. And being present with people, you know, people aren't with people anymore. <laughs> They're on their devices. They're thinking about other things. So this other concept I've introduced to probably a million people around the world seems really simple, but it's a whole notion of, you know, the idea of, have you ever been with a person and they were not there? Oh my have you ever God. been with a person and you were not, and, and you were not there? <laughs> yes. And, and that's, that's rampant. So this whole notion of being present, of being in the moment with people, people know when you're there for them. I mean, I, I learned this, I learned this from one of my children many years ago. We were trying to be a good dad and I was standing across the street from the house flying a kite with him and everybody going by would have said, isn't that great a father and son? But I wasn't there really. I was thinking about business. I was thinking about the next day. I was thinking about the day before, all this stuff. And he reached up and he pulled on my coat and he said, dad, he said, would you really play with me? Would you play with me today? Aww. And oh my God. And that, that was like a dagger in my heart. And since then, I really paid attention to being with people. And, you know, you mm-hmm. take people like whatever your politi- political convictions are, they say that, uh, that Bill Clinton, when he's in a room, you think you're the only person there with him. Mm-hmm. And what mm-hmm. he's got is the ability to be totally present with people. And yeah. so, um, uh, so that's about, you know, if you can be there, be present, be curious with relationships, you'll build relationships. Everybody wants people to be interested in them. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. And, you know, you mentioned your son and I was thinking of kids and I always say like kids are great examples of what we're talking about here. Right. They're so yeah. present. They're so full of curiosity and they haven't developed filters yet. So they come from that authenticity and, you know, the, that you, they really connect with people without really kind of thinking about what's next. And that's the problem too, with us not focused on the present is that we're too focused either on the future, like what's going to happen, the outcome, or we're focusing on the past, which is what has happened. And then like, maybe we're scared of getting hurt. So we freeze up or, you know, so I always tell people, let go of the past, let go of the future, just be right here. And I think that's exactly. what you're saying. That, that's so, so important uh, to building a relationship. Yeah. That whole notion of being present with a quieter mind. I think that the, the other things we find is that um, most of life is about these stories we make up in our head. We're always making up stories. Oh, right. Your friend earlier, she had this whole narrative about why that person had said something or when it didn't even exist. And so, mm-hmm. uh, p- so be aware of the stories. Catch yourself. Cause, and the way you'll know is that any, anytime you've got a story going on that lowers your spirit, Try to do a pattern interrupt. Take a walk. Stand up. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. I, uh, I, I'm on the road a lot, uh, you know, almost every week, coast to coast. And so, but I say I call Bernadette a couple times a day, my wife, because I just hear her voice and talk to her and my spirit races. She's there for me. She's present. And mm. so this whole notion of finding, the, finding those things in your life, whether it's a hobby, a book, music that raises your spirits because people want to be around people who are hopeful, optimistic, mm-hmm. or positive. And, uh, and while, and, and also they want to be around people who don't uh, assume motives about them and fly off the handle and make assumptions that are wrong about them. And so I'm not saying people can always live in the top of the middle there, but what you can do is spend more time up there by taking care of yourself uh, by all these things we've talked about, but you also can do less harm. And my theory is do no harm when you're in the lower levels. Uh Uh, Just say, hey, no matter how compelling that, if I feel like I absolutely have to tell somebody something right now because I'm so angry, I better not. It's not going to work. Wait till tomorrow. (laughs) Settle down. Think about it. Get organized. Don't, Don't damage your relationship. That's really good. I wonder because, you know, a lot of times I have people track their moods. Interestingly, there's a, um, Mm -hmm. you know, there's tons of apps out there and I use this particular app. And what would you say to people who 
you know, like when they track their moods and they find that 90% of the time they're down at the lower levels of that elevator, like they just can't see the way, like they, they just don't know any other way. What, what's the best way to kind of help them at least one floor up? You know, the strange thing is, is I'm not sure I'd track my mood. <laughs> ah. uh, I'd rather be in, in, I'd rather be in flow with life. I, mm-hmm. If I notice, I'm. If I begin to notice, if I, what I want to do is 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 not go to an app, but have this built-in noticing my own spirit. Just mm-hmm. begin to pay attention. That's mm-hmm. emotional intelligence, knowing yeah. what my state of mind is. That's what it is. So if I can, if I can know it, and it, and incidentally, here's what happens in um, in the higher states we have access to the full range of the brain from analysis processing common sense insight and wisdom as soon as we go down the mood elevator we lose access to common sense insight and wisdom and we come we become emotionally stupid and so uh-huh. people can just notice their feelings and then begin to one thing is to to know that it's, it's their own thinking that's doing it so it's almost like being in a bad movie mm-hmm. and you know mm-hmm. when i've got a bad day I say to myself, okay, this is like being in a bad movie. It's going to end. I'm going to go outside in a little bit. Right. <laughs> or the right. sun is still shining, you, even though it's raining today. I, I have this inner faith that the core of me is a good, loving person. And, mm. and that's, my, that's my God-given state. It's all of ours. It's all of our gift. We just screw it up. <laughs> and yeah. it's there at our center. And so what I try to do is to know that, hey, I'm in this bad place now, but that's not just me. Just be careful you don't do damage to people now. Know mm-hmm. that, have faith, you'll come back up. And do things that raise your spirit, friends, music, exercise, whatever Excellent. it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, finding those times, because I, I tell people that too, you know, people will come to me and say, oh, I'm not confident. I say, I don't believe that because there's always a place in, in one's life that they do feel confident yes. in, right? And I define confidence. Some area of expertise. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to say, usually we feel confident in things that we know or we've experienced and we've had positive, you know, experiences around that. And so I say like what you just said, you know, hone in on those times that you do feel good, that you do feel joy, that you feel confident. And let's see if we can get those aspects into those other areas that you're not feeling confident in. And so it is good. And because it's, I think, hard for people when they're in that negative state. And I also think another thing along the, the lines is be careful what you tell yourself because it will become true, right? And so even the words you choose, right, also can elicit positivity or negative things either way. Absolutely. And, mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I've you know thought a lot about these things. So just even the chapters in the book. So the yeah. whole notion of uh, nurturing faith and optimism, relationships in the mood elevator, dealing with your down days. Uh, uh, living in, A very interesting one is... Uh, living in mild preference. It's really interesting, a, a real quick story, but on airplanes, the seating's really tight. Mm-hmm. And some airplanes, it's just a couple inches tighter. When I try it, my roller bag, I try to pull it down, it just bangs both sides. It's awful, I have to drag it. Other planes, a couple inches wider, I can roll my bag down there. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, if we live life in a way that we require things to be a given way exactly, we're gonna have a tough life. Uh, mm-hmm. If, if go, mm-hmm. going to dinner, you're going to go to World War III with your partner over whether it's Mexican or French, then life's not going to be very good. And so this whole notion of the more I can be, be less rigid in how I need things to be in my relationship, in, in all these things, that the easier life gets. I think when people have rigid frameworks about how others need to be, uh, how things need to be, you know, good luck. So that, mm-hmm. that's another chapter that's kind of interesting in the book. And that is like beautiful parting words of wisdom. If I, it, like, I, it's like, boom, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've been doing this a while. Well, I just want to highlight some of these juicy tips you. that you gave. And then I want to right. hear like how everybody can find you. I mean, I, what I loved is, is just like, you know, really stop and having that awareness about yourself, you know, when you're in that lower part of the elevator to, to give yourself permission to stop and, and relax and maybe come back to it. Um, coming from that place of curiosity is great so that you can see someone else's point of view and stop assuming 
you know, and getting rid of all the stuff that's about you and really find out what's going on with other people. Take care of yourself. That is so, so important, you know, in terms of just how you feel, how you look, it does affect your moods and exercise and jump on trampolines. Um, (laughs) Be really (laughs) present in the moment. So important. I tell people that all the time. Be careful about the stories in your head. Do a pattern disruption. If you're finding yourself stuck in a rut, do something different to get out of that mood and and behaviors. And finally, just that, that state of positivity is so important and you can get out of it with, you know, just bouts of gratitude and, and everything that you just mentioned. Wow. I just want to keep going with you, but I, I know we have to end and you got to take off, but do you, is there any like last things you wanted to say and also let people know how they can find you? No, I mean, I think the notion is that we all have a best self and, yeah. uh, and that we should just have faith that we've got that. And, and, and also be grateful for life. We have so much going for us that uh, in life. So if people want to learn more, there is a, there's a website, themoodelevator.com. And you can also send information to Larry at themoodelevator.com. And, um, and there's some interesting videos on, the, on that website and things people might find of interest. Oh my gosh. Thank you so, so much for coming on. I really, really, it was amazing having you on. And anyway, this has been the Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, Kim Seltzer. And remember, you can build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. And make sure you go to my site, seltzerstyle.com. And if you're looking for a supportive community, help and help you express all those feelings that we talked about and going up and down the mood elevator, <laughs> come check out my new Facebook private group is called the Love Makeover Insiders and click the link you'll see in the show description. Stay tuned until next week with more tips on how to feel and look fabulous every day. <laughs>